Welcome to our continuing series of Virtual Voices, hosted by World Information Transfer and focusing on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Our presenter today is Punara Machaya, who is the CEO of the Chopra Foundation, dedicated to improving health, social, and planetary well-being. He is also the co-founder of Seva Love and Chopra X, a venture platform backing transformative reimagining the future of health and well-being with the world-renowned mind-body medicine pioneer and best-selling author, Dr. Deepak Chopra. He also co-founded Never Alone and Circa, an anxiety management platform with Sri Pillay, a Harvard-trained psychiatrist and brain researcher. He is on the board of many company, transformative companies and also has held senior management positions with Nortel, Motorola, and Sasken. He holds an MBA from the College of William and Mary and a BS in a computer science. Over to you, Mr. Machaya. Thank you, Dr. Durbeck. Uh, it is definitely an honor and pleasure to be sharing uh, a very important conversation today, which is very close to my heart. I've been working with Dr. Chopra for over two decades. And uh, the work we're doing today is the, the whole concept of what is called conscious leadership. The program I'm gonna to share today is actually what Dr. Chopra used to teach at Kellogg, uh, Columbia and many other universities all over the world and working with business leaders. And it's really important, this conversation today is so important, especially because I see it's a global audience. So what I'm gonna do right now, I'm gonna share my screen and uh, hopefully if you all can see the screen, give me a thumbs up. Uh, hopefully you all can see the screen okay. All good? Perfect. Yes, it's fine. Okay, excellent. So what I'm gonna do today is to give you a, a kind of a very quick overview on what the program is called, The Soul of Leadership. And this is based on Dr. Chopra's uh, number one selling book on leadership. And I want to kind of walk you all through the course today. And uh, the, the, when we opened this course, it was like, how do we create leadership in organizations? Because what's the challenge we have today is that when you go to a business school, it's always about how do I get a share of the market? How do I take somebody else's market share, right? That's what we're taught, right? The word strategy, in fact, comes from warfare, you know, some you know, strategic con or Arthashastra. So what I'm going to talk about today is the whole new paradigm of how can we all become more conscious leaders. And when, there's a link over here called cfi.choprafoundation.org. Everybody on this course who's on the Zoom right now can go register on this course online. It is a, it's a free course, but everything I share today will be actually uh, shared with Dr. Chopra, by Dr. Chopra, right? So that's kind of my uh, conversation. So the first thing, let's kind of get into the word strategy, right? The word strategy, which has been used today in business and politics in, in the world today, comes from war, right? In India, third century BC, it was called Arthashastra. And then it came Sun Tzu in the Art of War and also in the Roman Empire. So when you look at war, there are only three words we think about. Defeat, decimate, destroy. How do we defeat somebody? How do you, you know, decimate and then take over the take over the place, right? The same thing, it's gone from the war, which was there. Now it's also gone to the boardroom. Look at business today, it's about SWOT analysis, strength, weakness, opportunity, threats. The words and the language itself is about if somebody has a share of the pie, take over the share of the pie. But nobody talks about how do we recreate the pie? How do we recreate a new market? How do we kind of create new market boundaries? So that is really the biggest uh, concept we're going to talk about today in conscious leadership. The second challenge the world has today, there is a trust crisis. There is globally a trust crisis. People don't believe in God. It doesn't matter about that. People don't believe in their nation states and their leaders. People don't believe in their companies and the leadership they are. And people don't even, children today growing up don't even believe in their parents. So there is a global trust crisis. In fact, you look at mental health today, mental health every 40 seconds you lose someone to suicide globally the mental health crisis among young adults is really rising that's a silent pandemic 
And the number one reason, there's a lack of trust, especially in leadership. And today, this is actually a survey which was done. And it's, it's kind of astonishing, right? The two most asked questions today, when you meet a leader, can I trust you? Can I respect you? Right? And these are two very important questions. Can I trust you? Imagine these are questions we're having with our leaders today. And in a survey which is done by Edelman, one in three employees don't trust the employer and 40% don't trust their CEO. So we can replace CEO with the leaders of states or you know, whatever leadership is. So all in all, we have a leadership crisis. And most important thing for us now is to figure out how do we create conscious leaders? So this is really a, a, a kind of what we really are going to talk about today. What is the soul of leadership? And I want to maybe ask you all, this is a meditation I do every day, right? And we can actually do it today, right? I think we, every day when you get up and for the group over here, we can just be very silent and just well, whatever you're doing today, just, you know, just stop just for the next 30 seconds. Just reflect on the four questions I'm going to ask you all. And these four, four questions are going to be called the soul questions, right? The first question, who am I? Who am I, right? When I say I'm Punacha Machaya, that is just a condition name. That's my name my parents gave me. I belong to India. But who am I? Who am I at the core of my being? And the biggest question we have to ask ourselves today is not about outer space. It's about a journey to inner space. Who am I? Second soul question. What do I want? Right? We're all spiritual beings having a human existence. What do I want? Right? What do I want from this world? What do I want from what I'm studying? What I'm in the organization I am I'm in? Third question. What is my purpose? Why am I here? Why am I doing all of these things? What is my purpose? And the fourth soul question. What am I grateful for? You should be grateful for so many different things. My dad always said, my father said, I complained I had no shoes until I saw a man who had no feet. Gratitude is the most important thing for us to have in the world, to irrespective of what's happening. So those are, those are the four soul, soul questions. But what I want to do right now is to dive into the soul of leadership, right? So an acronym is LEADERS, L-E-A-D-E-R-S. So it's a very easy thing to remember, LEADERS. So the first L, look and listen, right? Today, people have stopped, have, do not know how to look or listen, right? And this is very interesting because when you listen truly, you listen with, without observing, without analyzing, just observe everything, then analyze, then feel, and then incubate. Today, when I, I'm in New York, I go to a lot of these meetings and people are just like, they say hello and they're looking at somewhere else. As a good leader, as somebody you need to lead, you need to look and listen. And the challenge we have, in the, especially in the younger generation, there is no attention, right? You, you can probably remember that. Everybody is like busy switching, doing something. We are talking, listening. I'm speaking right now, probably on the phones, texting, listening. Just look and listen. Only when we look and listen will the next thing happen. In fact, there's a program which we are now launching for communities to bring people together. And it's called Love in Action. And it's based on four A's. The first A is attention, deep listening, listening with your body, mind, and spirit. The second A is appreciation. Only when you have attention can you appreciate each and everyone's beauty and their magic, how amazing people are. If you don't have attention, there's no appreciation. Once you have appreciation, then there's affection, love, kindness, tenderness, compassion. And the fourth A is acceptance, right? Accepting yourself before you can accept anybody else. So it's really, really important for us to look and listen. If not, life passes us by. And this is not just about work or being a leader. This is important even in your personal life right, and professional life. If you look and listen, only then you can do anything else. So start today by looking and listening. And, and there are four stages, right? The first is the body, which is your senses. You're just gathering information. Then your mind comes in. It analyzes. Then your heart kicks in. You feel it. Then you incubate it, then you act on it, right? So you're really important today as conscious leaders not to be reactive, right? That's a very reptilian brain. We are the prefrontal cortex, which is, you know, we can actually analyze, incubate, listen, don't just jump to conclusions, right? 
Then this is an exercise I do uh, at a, this, what I'm talking about today, we typically do it over a four or five day period. But I would like everybody today maybe to, and this is why we go online to the website, this is going to be a lot more in detail, right? To create your soul profile, not your LinkedIn profile. Like everybody knows your LinkedIn profile, what I do, and the CEO of the foundation and the managing partner of Chopra X. You can go to LinkedIn and find out all those details. But you know, this is these are questions I want you all to answer to yourself, deep introspecting as a leader, who, what are we are doing today? These are the seven questions. What is my contribution in life? You know, what's the purpose in what I do, right? How do I feel when I have peak experiences? Who are the people I resonate with? What are the qualities I look for in a best friend? What are my unique skills and talents? This is something I'm 54 right now. A question I keep asking myself every day. Kunacha, what is, what is the one skill you have that is so unique that nobody else in the world has it? And everybody is a superhero. Everybody born in this planet. Everybody listen. You are a superhero. And you have a unique skill and talent that nobody else in the world has. How do you find that? And once you find that, that's it, right? You kind of, that's what you live to. So this is Dr. Dr. Chopra's soul profile. I'm not going to, but this is an example I want to share with you how he wrote this and made it almost, he put this as a banner and said, this is what my soul profile is, right? So I want everybody to kind of go in and then once you have a soul profile, you then you create your personal vision. I want to live in a world in which da, 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 right? I always say I want to live in a world which is more peaceful, which is just, which is sustainable, healthy, and joyful. That's a world I imagine, right? I want to be inspired to work in an organization, does what? I want to be proud to lead a team and do what, right? So when, you, when you're very clear about what you want, then the universe conspires. Sometimes what happens is that we are not very clear about what we really want, but we know whatever is happening to us is not what we want. Only when there's clarity, we can get into the detail, right? So then you, once you do your personal vision, you go to your organizational vision, right? So this is kind of, you know, uh, I would say let's everybody should, you know, try to work on the mission statement. And then I'm going to, like I said, go to, my email address is going to be there. If anybody has questions, please send me an email. The reason I'm doing this today is because I believe every person listening to this today can change the world, right? You all can change the world and make it a better place. Together, we can make it a better place. So that was L, look and listen. E, the second E, emotional bonding, right? You have to be able to connect, right? They say leaders bring out the best in others, but successful, successful visionaries create lasting bonds, right? You all say, you know, I work in this team. I have this friend. It's amazing how I connect with them. You have to connect with people. In fact, Google, I think, if I'm not mistaken, did a, a study. It's called Project Aristotle. They did a, a longitudinal study over a 10-year period, if I'm not mistaken. But what they found, what makes a successful manager? Or what, why are some people so successful at Google? But others, what is that? They thought, is it because of the degrees they've had, the universities they went? No, the number one thing was psychological safety. When the manager helped the team feel safe, then they brought out the best in the team. So that's the same thing, right? How do you create emotional bonds and lasting relationships which can transcend everything? Emotional bonding, very important as a leader. Um, the next thing, how do you create, you know, very emotional bonding? You know, I always say, you know, avoid the three A's. Don't be authoritarian, you know, command and control my way or the highway or anger. You know, leaders have control over emotion. Also, the things which I've heard in the past, which said, if you're a leader, you're like an eagle, you fly alone and nobody else is with you. No, you cannot be aloof. The world we live in today, being emotionally bonded and connected is a very important attribute for a leader, right? Um, I'm going to not go to basically, the so second A, after E, emotional bonding is awareness, and just being cognizant of time. I know that I have 20 minutes here. So the second A is E, A, awareness. Be aware. If you don't know who you are, like I said, if you don't know where you're going, any road can take you there, right? So very important to awareness as a leader. And awareness comes in to be, to know who you are, who am I? Once you know who you are, then you can connect with everybody else. So this is what we say, awareness is the birthplace of infinite possibilities, right? 
And this is some of the tips, right? I always say, you know, you got to kind of listen to your inner voice. This is where meditation helps. What I asked you is a, to do in the beginning was just four questions. You can do this anytime. You're sitting down, waiting for the next meeting, or you're driving in a car, or you're in a subway, or wherever you are. Four questions. Just close your eyes and say, who am I? What do I want? What is my purpose? And what am I grateful for? And in that process, you will actually get these answers and, and insights. And then you kind of start centering yourself. So you are operating from a place where you know who you are. Once you know who you are, it doesn't matter what other people think you are. You know who you are, right? And that's important. So do not confuse yourself and the selfie, right? The selfie is the external world you're showing. But who are you, right, is a very important question to ask. That is A, awareness. So L-E-A, the next thing is D, doing. So I always say strategy is a commodity, execution is an art. Leaders do, leaders execute, right? So very important aspect. So you should, if you're, one of the most important things to build trust is to have skill and competency, have a vision, and then do and execute. But when you're executing, based on the previous, you looked and listened, you got all the information, you've analyzed, you've incubated it, you know what what you what what you really internalized it. You emotionally bonded with all the team, your people. You have a deep awareness. Now it's time to execute, right? If you just execute without looking and listening, without bonding, without awareness, then it's meaningless. And that's what conscious leadership is about: is being aware, right? And that's the doing part, right? And there's a lot of things you can do as a doer, right? When you're thinking about it, as a leader, you go through multiple roles, right? And sometimes there's a crisis, you're a protector, right? Somebody's down, you have to be a motivator. You know, if you want to bring people together, you're a team builder, right? You sometimes people having challenges, you've got to be a counselor or a nurturer. You need something to solve something, you have to be a catalyst. So really understand the roles you're playing and what you need to do to do the job right, right? These are things you need to kind of understand as, as a leader. And this is something, a very simple exercise. Uh, sometimes, you know, you're in the, in the middle of a crisis and you're about to do something and you're just kind of confused. I say stop. S-T-O-P, right? S is stop. T is take a deep breath and smile. O is observe and P is proceed with awareness. Just a simple pause and asking the question to yourself, is this decision I'm doing, does it feel right? Is it fair and honest? Can I trust myself or what I'm being told? You know, just just pausing for a few seconds and acting from that, you'll be able to take much better decisions, right? And then the next E, L-E-A-D, you've done the doing. Now the next thing is empowerment. Empowerment is not, it's just the way you say, you know what? You're working with somebody in your team. You know what? Go do it. I got your back. I'm empowering you. People follow leaders who give them a platform and say, you know what? You do it. It might not be perfect, but you know what? I am there to be with you every step of the way. Empowerment, right? Very, very important. And this is an important attribute, which I believe, you know, how do you, how do you kind of become a transformative leader is by help, trusting people, being compassionate, providing stability and providing hope, right? This is important when you talk about how do you create empowerment in your team? Another one, L-E-A-D-E-R, responsibility, right? It's important as a leader that you have to be responsible for what you do. You got you to own it, right? And when you talk about responsibility, this is what I say. I'm responsible for what I think, how I feel, how I perceive the world, my relationships, my role in society, my immediate environment, my speech and my body. I am the captain of my ship. And you have to take responsibility. Not everything else around you might happen, but you are responsible. You have, you have. I think, uh, you know, we always, who I forget, Victor Frankl says, man search for meaning. I always have a choice and I will choose love, right? You always have a choice. And that's such a powerful book, Man Search for Meaning. I recommend everybody to read that book. It was a transformative book in my life. And I think, you know, you always have a choice as a leader and you are all can always be responsible. It doesn't matter what happens, right? That is the beauty of who you are. And that's what I want to remind everybody today. We're all superheroes, right? Just have to find out what, what, our, what our superhero skill is. 
And when you do this, look and listen, emotional bonding, awareness, doing, right? Empower, responsibility. Then it comes to synchronicity. The magic happens in your life, right? And that's something which, you know, which I wanted to kind of leave you all with today as um, 20 minutes. So I want to make sure that I provide kind of a reader's digest version of, you know, what it means to be a conscious leader. This is my email. You can, you know, email me anytime if you have any questions, but do go to the website. It is called uh, cfi.choprafoundation.org. I want to share that with you in the, in the meeting over here. And then you can actually go to the website. There's a course called The Soul of Leadership. Enroll in it. Ask me any questions. And then this is a good start for us to kind of see, become, you know, leaders who can make the world a better place. Personal transformation, community transformation, planetary transformation. Thank you. Thank you very, very much for a very inspiring lecture. Uh, some of the stuff that you were talking, I remember from listening to Dr. Chopra's lecture. But uh, um, now we'll return over to Susie Halleck, who's our moderator, and she will ask you all the questions. And again, thank you for giving the information so that the people that are listening can write to you and ask you other questions questions that you may answer at your convenience. Over to thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dobrak. Thank you, and thank, I echo the comments about such an inspiring presentation. Have you heard of the concept of a servant leader? Um, it kind of aligns with a lot of the principles you talked about, and if so, what do you think about this concept? Absolutely, yes, I definitely believe in it. I believe the goal of a leader is to be uh, an enabler, right? It's not chief executive officer, it's chief enabling officer right? If you're an enabler and if you're in service to your team and your community, that's how you inspire, right? It's a leadership with the word inspiration, right? And I think so much of the word today we have forgotten. That's why great leaders are great storytellers. They're able to inspire with stories. People do not change with motivation. Everybody's motivated. People change because of inspiration. And that's why storytelling and leadership and living it, living the truth is very important. So many of us, people say a lot of things, but you look at them and you, and you sense it and you realize, hmm, they're not really living it, you know? A lot of it is talk. You also mentioned that um, populations are becoming less and less religious um, and there, there's less trust in leadership as well. So how do you think we can foster positivity and resilience during tough times as well as the feeling that we're all working toward a common goal, which is what religion previously um, taught societies. Yes. Yeah, I think what when we talk, talk about religion, church, temple, synagogue, mosque, they're all places where we all hung out, right? And you kind of build a certain number of trust. So I think I want to share something. Maybe I call it my trust formula, right? And maybe I'll share this with you guys, with you all. What are some of the things? They say, do you trust somebody? They say, yeah, I trust somebody because they're good people. But this is what I think you look, how you can build trust. People trust people who are transparent, right? And if you're transparent, doesn't matter as a leader or a personal or professional, people trust people who are transparent. Second attribute, people trust people who make and keep their commitments and promises, right? So build, make and keep your commitments and promises. People trust people, personal or professional, who have expertise, right? If you have a heart problem, you go to a cardiologist. You don't go to orthopedic, right? So same thing, if you, whatever the expertise, you've got to have a relationship. If you have a personal relationship, you have to bring expertise. People trust people with expertise. People trust people who delegate, right? Who have, you know, have support each other. So if you work on these attributes, you build trust, right? And I think today as a society, we have to build trust. And once you build trust, you have to build intimacy. And that's what I talked about, love and action. The four A's, attention, deep listening, appreciation, acknowledgement. And the third A is affection, love, kindness, tenderness, compassion. The fourth A is acceptance. And that's how you can bring it together. How can mindfulness practices help younger generations with active listening? Um, do you think these practices should be taught in schools or how can we kind of enable the younger generations to um, improve yeah, their I think listening skills? This is like a passion area for me. I think, you know, mindfulness, I think before used to be a closed eye, sit down and close your eyes, ask questions. Mindfulness is basically a state of flow. And you feel selfless, timeless, effortless, and richness of experience, right? So you could be playing a game. You could be playing Call of Duty or you're playing League of Legends. Whatever you're doing, 
But in between, if you can just pause and connect with yourself, right? Just a few minutes to know who you are. I think today, I think so my whole goal is how to use gaming to bring about mindfulness. I think, I think gamers are amazingly in flow. It's just a question, how do you use that flow to kind of ask the question? So if you had a game, I'm playing Fortnite, and imagine I can say, hey, you got to solve this small thing question on who am I? And it's like a skill set. It's attention and focus. And if I can do that skill set, I can go to the next level. So you can use the gaming. So I think today we got to understand the, the generation growing up. I have two boys who are 22 and 19. And I talked to my 19-year-old. He's a gamer, right? I, I have to talk to him in the language. So I think we, my generation, has to understand your generation and younger and see how do we use the new mediums to bring about what we want to do. But I definitely believe when we have, when we are connected, example, just pretty simple, take a deep breath, pause and just let go. The act of just breathing reduces anxiety, right? We've just lost the ability to breathe, right? So imagine I could teach you how to be, play Fortnite better or Call of Duty and in between, I taught you how to breathe better, right? Hey, how can you be a better Fortnite player if you can breathe? And by the by teaching you how to breathe, I can do activate multiple other things. Very interesting. And this ties into the following question, which is how technology has shaped the way our minds operate and how we listen and what can we do to mitigate negative impacts on our mental health and productivity? Um, so it sounds like yeah. embracing some of this technology as well too. I think being very conscious about everything. You know, people ask me, is technology good or technology bad? It depends, right? Right now, this is a very good use of technology. I'm able to connect with people all over the world. I'm able to share my very good use of technology. But if I was, Susie, if you were sitting next to me over here and I was texting you and sort of talking to you, that's a bad use of technology, right? Technology is always neutral. How we use technology is up to us, right? It could be an ally or it could be a you know friend or foe, depend how we use it. I think today, what I would say is that when you build anything, use anything, you know, we have to always look back and say, what is the exact, how are we using this technology? Asking the question, not being mindless, right? being mindful about how we use technology. One of the audience members is particularly interested in Never Alone and Circa mental health support initiatives. How do you see right. the development of such initiatives, especially with respect to digital technology and AI solutions? So yeah, with Never Alone, it's very interesting. So before the during the pandemic, I had deployed Never Alone as an AI chatbot uh, because we figured everybody was stuck. What do I do and how do we help people out? I had more than 26 million messages on the chatbot, right? And more than 4,800 suicidal ideation interventions on an AI chatbot. I took it offline because now with all the technology coming up, we want to kind of work on the next generation, which is moving away from suicide prevention to basically education and awareness. So I think technology can play a huge part. Just look at the question. We have, every 40 seconds, we lose, some, lose someone to suicide globally. Every 40 seconds. There cannot be enough therapists, right? It has to be technology-led interventions. Uh, it also has to be democratized. Having a therapist is a luxury, right? It's not like every all over the world we have access to this. So my goal is to really use tools and technologies to help people with anxiety. So Circa, example, is a mnemonic I'm working with a Harvard anxiety specialist on, is how do you help people with anxiety? That's the number one precursor, right? The C, I, R, C, A, C is chunky. Let's say somebody is trying to do their homework tonight and there's so many questions I can't answer it. I'm getting anxious. Chunk it. The 10 questions, answer two, right? I is ignore mental chatter. Do a deep breath, listen to some music, just ignore the chatter in the brain. R is reality check. Not finishing 10 questions is it the end of the world. C is control check. How much control do I have on this finishing my homework today? A is attention shift. Take a pause. Just get off, you know. Don't get caught in the loop. Just pause a little bit. So these are things we can educate people, provide the tools, and really, you know, that's really been the purpose, you know, of Never Alone in Circa. Thank you for sharing. What specific principles and goals inspire you in your work toward improving health and well-being? You know, I, so for me, my number one passion is two things. One is mental health and suicide prevention, right? That is my number one, you know, number one objective to be here is I believe the silent pandemic, pandemic is mental health and we need to do something about it. Everybody, every family I know has somebody or someone who's going through it. I've, you know, so for me, that's really, really important. And I feel our generation is growing up. 
How do we make them more resilient? What are the tools we can give them? So that's on one end of the spectrum, young adults. The second end of the spectrum is, I would say, healthcare system. People are going to live longer. How do we live better, right? Uh, and, the, and the older generation, health span, right? As we go older, right? And then you have an entire generation now who's going to live older, but how do you live better? So I'm doing a lot of work on improving healthcare, health system, preventive health. Longevity is a big focus for me. Those are the two areas. So mental health and longevity. Look at cognitive decline, right? Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, dementia. Everybody is going to be, if you're going to live up to 125, you're going to hit it, right? Now, how do you keep cognitive function up, up, up so it's not a burden on the healthcare system? And for me, I believe, and this is the work of the Chopra Foundation, that people do not have to have disease. They follow the seven principles. So I'll share them with you right now. Seven principles. First is nourish, eat better, right? Two is move, right? Third is manage emotions, healthy emotion. Fourth, have a mind-body practice. Fifth is sleep. Sixth is have a sense of community, connect. Seventh is connect with nature, rhythms of nature. And when you do these seven things, you return the body to homeostasis, you reduce chronic low-grade inflammation, and you prevent disease. What do you believe has the greatest impact on the mental health of our society as a whole in present day? I think connection, community. We are super connected, but very lonely, right? We, uh, that is a tragedy. You know, how can we have 8 billion people and people have nobody to reach out to? That is a tragedy, right? So for me, it's about creating intimacy and connection. We all need to hug each other. We need to hold each other. We need to say, I love you. We need to be connected. Uh, you know, that is something which we have, we have, you know, I always say, if I, if I build an app, it's going to be the opposite of Tinder. It's going to be called Tender, right? How do we be more tender as people? You know, I think we just need human connection. I think that's really... You know, everybody in this group, you know, just send a message somebody to today saying, I care, I care about you. Send them an emoji. Let's create a pandemic of joy because joy is the only measure of success, right? Let's be joyful. Let's share joy. Let's be joy, right? And we've forgotten that, right? We have to be that. If there's everything going on in the world today, it's hard to find joy, but we have to keep it somehow. That's why Viktor Frankl's book is a good book to read. What, what do you think is the ideal balance between virtual and in-person working? I don't know. I don't believe in balance. I think you got to do whatever the right thing for the right moment, you know. Otherwise, you know, you got to do right. You know, I think I always believe that if I can meet somebody, hug somebody, be with somebody, I'll do it always face-to-face. -face. The next best thing is if everything, then I have to go, you know, virtual. I prefer, you know, I maybe it's, you know, that's just the way I work. You shared a lot of great principles that you follow today. Um, are there any other methods you use to teach yourself to find motivation and inspiration every day? No, I think my purpose, my my vision, my personal vision, like I said, is to, re is to create a critical mass for a more peaceful, just, sustainable, healthy, and joyful world. Every day I get up and I say, you know what, did I do that? Did I do something today which helped me move towards that goal? Today I can go to sleep right now and say, okay, I spoke to a few people on Zoom today and hopefully I shared what it is. And if even one person takes something from this, my job is done, right? How do we help? And that's really been my kind of motto every day. That's one, one person better than yesterday. In your opinion, what extent are your thoughts able to become your reality? I mean, your thoughts, uh, you know, uh, basically fashion the outcome, right? So if I look at resilience, uh, example is a very important topic. I, I believe in the ABC principle, right? Uh, a, doesn't matter what's happening in your life. Adversity hits everybody in the world. Doesn't matter who they are, where they are. The pandemic taught us that. Doesn't matter if you're a billionaire, it's still you had COVID, right? Doesn't matter who you are, right? So ABC, A, is always have an attitude of gratitude. Is a glass half empty or half full? B, is believe in impermanence. This too shall pass. You know, if you know, today, what are they going through the deepest, darkest winter of your life? Tomorrow, there's spring and there's summer, right? It doesn't matter. The world will continuously, as impermanence, the only permanent thing. C is con make a conscious choice. You can always choose love. I always believe, doesn't matter what's going on, have, you know, have resilience, right? Build resilience. You mentioned the importance of nutrition and movement. Which methods have you found useful to stay physically healthy with a demanding job? 
You know, nutrition, I said, I didn't even say nourishment because we all 23,000 human genes so between all of us in this group, 99.9% are exactly the same, right? But there are 2 million microbial genes. It's a food we eat. The gut, the gut and the brain are connected to the 10th cranial nerve called the vagus nerve. So very important for us to eat right, right? Eat food which has got vitality, right? I don't believe in any diet, but it's very personal today. Eat food which makes you feel lighter, makes you feel nourished. As far as movement, for me, what I do is that uh, just because I travel quite a bit and all of that, I kind of use mostly yoga and movement, right? And I walk a lot. doesn't matter. I try to try to walk as much as possible. Uh, during my younger days, I was a lot into martial arts and I busted my body pretty bad uh, as a motorcycle. So I think now it's mostly uh, yoga and you know, I, I try to walk. You know, I try to get my 10,000 steps in. doesn't matter what happens. And sometimes being in New York makes it easy. But when you travel a lot, it's hard. So I think yoga helps quite a bit. Being flexible. Flexibility is key. In fact, there's a very famous, an, an Indian sage said, infinite flexibility is the key to immortality. And the inflexibility of the mind and the body is very important for us to be you know, immortal, metaphorically speaking. Very interesting. In a rapidly changing world, what strategies can leaders use to foster innovation, adaptability, and resilience within their teams and organizations while still maintaining a clear sense of purpose and direction? I would say, like I said, look and listen. You know, when you're constantly looking and listening and kind of keeping a beginner's mind and adapting and changing. A lot of the big companies were not big anymore, almost disappeared because they were way too arrogant. They were not looking at the global changes and the shifts. And they really thought, uh, we have... I'm here, we are the big company, we are good. And then the silent person, small company comes from the side and takes over. Always look and listen to the changing tides and then pivot with required. Change right, is the only constant. Right? Always change is the only constant. Keeps on changing. So embrace change. Be the master at change. Yeah. How would you advise someone who's looking to rebuild their mindset, but they're having trouble finding a place to start this journey? Just start by just start by just watching your breath, right? Right now, just take a deep breath, hold, let go. Just start, just literally start by just observing your breath, and take a take a few seconds just to pause, observe your breath, see how you feel. Everybody right now, if you just stop for a second, observe. And move on, right? You can you can take time for yourself. People should take a few seconds just pausing for themselves. How how do you develop both strategy and execution skills? You mentioned having both is important, but they can be a bit different. So how would you recommend someone develop both? First of all, I think you need to be if you strategy uh, from my perspective is what is a vision, right? What is a big vision, right? The auth is the authenticity, integrity, higher purpose. For me, anything I do, I ask myself the question, am I authentic? Do I have the integrity? And is there a higher purpose, right? Once you have that, I would say, direction, then you build the strategy to that, the execution for that. And third, when it comes to execution and all that, it's just experience. Sometimes it's just experience, right? I've made a lot of mistakes in my life. And because of that, I've learned, right? My, my lessons and my failures have been my teacher. I also, I also, I joke, what is longevity? I said, you want the wisdom of age and the biology of youth, right? That is the magic. You want to age because wisdom of age is what you want. I don't want to be reverse aging. I want the age of what I, who I am right now. But you want the biology of youth, right? And that's the magic. And that's what we can do. How do you... Uh, one of the audience members is interested by this and said, how do you make the right decision if you are afraid of making a mistake? You know, I think, okay, so what is fear? So the question is fear, right? Because that's what, so I have an acronym for fear. Fear, F, is false evidence appearing real, right? False evidence appearing real. If the light is dim and there's a rope in the corner of the room, it looks like a snake. Turn on the light, right? So anything you have a fear on, turn on the lights, right? So you just observe it, get into it, deal with it. And once you shine the light on whatever it is, you will find the way, right? 
So if you give me an example, I can tell you what that is, right? So if you fear that, you know what, uh, if I make these mistakes, my, my colleagues are going to laugh at me, right? But if you know who you are and you have a strong internal compass, it doesn't matter what people say because you know who you are, right? And then you act from that purpose. So it's very important. When you have your compass, and today I think that's why I said don't confuse yourself and your selfie, right? The selfie is what you put the, on Instagram and Facebook and all of that. But the self is who you are. And that is, you know, the, your core of your being. And when you operate from that space, there's no fear. If you could go back in time, what advice would you give yourself when you were a student? Oh, man, I would say don't miss any opportunity to meet somebody, hug somebody, you know, just just be real. I mean, there's so many times in my life I've missed not being present. Yes, I would say that. I've spent a lot of times in my, in some, sometimes in my meeting, I wasn't present. I was thinking of something else or doing something else. I wasn't present, right? Even my whole thing, I, was, I have two boys growing up. I wasn't present in their lives as much as I should have. I was busy working and doing all this stuff. I could have been more present, right? I made excuses that I'm busy with work. I should have been more present. I, I think that's something like I said, always this moment, like the, the last, you know, 40 minutes is never going to happen again in your life, ever, right? It's done. It's over. It's a dream. And sometimes you got to be present because this moment is the present, right? And that's why being present to the magic is important. And I realized in my life, only thing which is precious is time. You will never get it back, right? And that to me, so the last 42 minutes with you all is my biggest gift because I will never have that moment again, ever. As I see these words, it's finished. So I'd rather be present. And that's one thing which I've learned now to be present. After this is over, I can go do something else. But right now, I want to be present. So I am giving my 100% to you all, my intention and my attention. What advice would you give students who are interested in being entrepreneurs in the future? It is uh, being an entrepreneur is a, it's a marathon, not a sprint, right? That's why you'd be like me, white hair or no hair. But, you know, it is, it is actually a marathon. But if you believe in what you do, and like I said, if you authenticity, integrity, higher purpose, everything I do, I like to have a social cause. That's what I believe in. That's my compass. Doesn't mean anybody else's compass, but I believe in, I am a technologist. I want to use technology for good. So everything I do something. So I think for, for, it's not like everybody from overnight becomes a, Elon Musk or a Zuckerberg, or what doesn't matter. If as an entrepreneur, life is a marathon, not a sprint, right? So, and, and if it's a marathon, you cannot do it alone. You need to have a team too. You need a support team, family, friends. Entrepreneurship is not a lonely sport. Life is a team sport. Remember that life is a team sport. You need a team. Do you think leadership can be learned throughout life or are some people more equipped to be leaders while others are more equipped to be doers, which is fine because you need both. I don't think so. I feel everybody is a born, has a trait in them. It's about, it's like a muscle, right? Everybody has skills, has abilities, some more than others, but everything can be, you know, if I told you that, you know, I actually stutter, I was stammering issue. I cannot, you know, when I went to school earlier on as a child, I would hate going to school because I could not speak in public. Uh, that was what I thought I had until my mom, told me that, son, the uh, thing with you is that you're really smart and you, you know, people can't keep up with you. So you need to really slow down for people. And that really solved my stuttering issue, right? So everything is a trait, right? There's neuroplasticity in the brain. Everything is a muscle you can build. There's that zero, no limitation, right? If your mind can conceive it and your heart can believe it, I know you can do it, right? That's important for us. A lot of people tell us what we cannot do. I think the goal of leaders and uh, teachers and professors is to find out everybody's superpower, right? Like Susie, what is your superpower? And we as a team should do everything we can to enable your superpower, right? So you can be a superwoman and a superhuman. <laughs> how, how do you think someone can establish an emotional connection with colleagues when, when they're new to the workplace? I told you the four pillars, be transparent, transparency, make and keep your commitments, right? Show your expertise and delegate, right? That principle doesn't change. 
if you're transparent, people trust people who are transparent. People don't trust people who are not transparent. So that's very simple. If you follow these four, four pillars of building trust, personal, professional, doesn't matter what it is, it works universally from my perspective. And how do you think someone can be a transparent leader without offending others? So if you're authenticity, integrity, and higher purpose, if you truly operate from that space, then you know what? It doesn't matter, right? You cannot make everybody happy, right? But you can make yourself happy. And if you are happy, others will be happy, right? I cannot say something today because I just want to make Susie happy. I want to make, you know, just, you know, Yana happy. I want to do something. I believe that's what I'm doing. And what happens is a byproduct, right? I have control over what I say. I don't have control over what you do, right? It's very hard to do what, what you want to do. How can you make somebody else do something, right? So I always say act from your own moral compass. Make sure it's authentic. Make sure you have integrity. Make sure you have higher purpose. Then output is output. You have no control over the world. It doesn't matter what you say today in the world. There will be 8 billion people out there. You can't make 8 billion people happy, right? There'll be somebody who'll be unhappy. So you have control over you, right? So you be you. Is there anyone either from history, fiction, or in present day who has greatly in inspired or influenced you throughout your life? There are many people. I mean, I would say Mahatma Gandhi was a big influence in my life, you know, growing up in India. Because how can a guy, man who is half naked, wearing a loincloth, running around saying, I'm going to free India against the British, like, you know? So the whole movement on non ahimsa and non-violence became something which became very core to me. Dr. Chopra has been a big influence in my life because you know I was a very different person. And in my I'm an entrepreneur, I'm in corporate America, and to really go on to this world where I want to get peaceful, just, sustainable, healthy, and joyful world, a big influence in my life, right? So I think there was, I think there are different people in different stages who have been influences in my life. My father has been, uh, you know, helping who recently passed, was an amazing influence. My mom, I think my father and mother are living uh, inspi inspirational people for me in my life. Could you share your perspective on the future of health and well-being and what role emerging technologies and ventures will play in shaping it? I think the future of, I call it the five Ps because of technology. The future of health and wellness is, first of all, predictable. Right? Everybody's health and wellness can be predicted genome, epigenome, microbiome, we can predict it now, right? If we can predict it, you can prevent it. To prevent it, you need to personalize it. To personalize, we need to have a process. And most importantly, you need to have people participate. This is where technology can come in today, right? We can help you predict it because we have all the genomic research, right? We can now prevent it because we can now give you, you know, tools to kind of help you prevent diabetes. We know you have early onset diabetes, right? So this is where I think technology, AI, and everything else happening around our world today can help us bring, make the five Ps happen. Throughout your career, did you ever experience burnout? And if so, how did you overcome it? You know, I, I, have, I have experienced burnout in my, in my past, I think. But for me, my own practice of why do I do what I do, right? Burnout happens sometimes when you really have no control of the environment and you're doing things you have to do, but you're like, oh my God, I'm stuck. Every time for me in my life is that, you know, why do I do what I do, right? Then I say, you know what, this is why I do. I want a more peaceful, just, sustainable, healthy, and joyful world. I need to keep doing this, right? And that's why having this vision and a compass. So it happens over different phases of your life. It can't say when I was 28, 29, I definitely wasn't why wow, I'm right now at 53, 54, right? So I think it just depends on your stage of your life. But always having this goal of why do I do what I do? right? That's why this who am I is such an important aspect, right? If I don't know who I am, then there's definitely going to be a burnout. Because you sometimes feel like, why am I stuck in this nightmare? Why can't I get out of this? And you know that sometimes I get to go to where I want to by being in a place I don't want to be, I don't have to be, it gets you over this burnout phase. What inspired you to create the Chopra X platform? And can you tell us a bit more about it? Yeah, the Chopra X for me was to really help entrepreneurs, right? I realized that everybody has an amazing idea. Uh, but, you know, how do you take it to market? And I realized and Deepak, Dr. Chopra, at this stage of his life, he said, you know, we have 26 million people who are in our network, in Dr. Chopra's network. 
let's say somebody in this group has a, an idea to build a new game to help children with anxiety, right? We can now support them. So for us, we want our Choprex to become a platform to really help entrepreneurs to kind of help them take solutions to market focused on health and wellness. If somebody has a solution for, let's say, e-commerce, that's not what we do. But somebody has a solution to make, you know, personal transformation, societal transformation, planetary transformation. That's what we want to support. That's why Chopra X came around. Often, um, especially in the youth, uh, they kind of feel a burden of achieving success. And you should be able to earn a million by 30, buy a car, build a house, have a family, children, etc. cetera. Um, how, how do you think this definition of success is, is changing? And it, do you think that's for the better? I, agree, I, I totally agree. When I came to this country, the United States in 1991, all I wanted was a fast car, a big house, smoke a cigar and drink scotch, right? That was my American dream, right? When I look at my boys today, I mean, they have a very different world. They want to travel. They want to experience. They don't want to really, they want to, you know, they can couch surf. They don't need to buy a house. They'll go live somewhere else for three months and hang out know, and learn the language. So I think the move, world is moving towards a shared economy. And this new, your generation, younger generation, I think I have so much hope. They don't believe in boundaries. They don't believe in wars. They believe in, you know, really bringing people together. And they really believe in principles versus scarcity. So I really believe that, you know, that's, that's, the, that's the future. Right? Thank you. Um... Dr. Durbeck, do you have any questions? Uh, quite honestly, yes, I have a couple, but basically and your presentation was just wonderful. I think uh, one of the most important things that uh, you seem to promulgate is the importance of making conscious choices in your lives and to what extent the choices can teach you to move in the direction that you really would like to fulfill. I I work with patients all my life, and that is basically what I do. I take the fearful, the neglected, basically the abused individual, and help them find what they are and how they can make a better life for themselves. And it's interesting that you mentioned yoga because uh, I used to teach uh, medical students how yoga, so that they were able to uh, respond more effectively to their surroundings and to their lives. And uh, I have examples of some of my former students that basically made significant changes in their lives and how they approach their own families and others based on their understanding and, and their uh, ability to meditate so that they could find out what is their inner fear um, and I used to lead them through a cave, interestingly enough, to find their inner fear and to take them out from that cave with the understanding of what really interfered with their ability to make their choices. So uh, that's basically not a question, but I think it just confirms what you were saying. I also think that uh, the um, indications that you brought forward, uh, how to deal with the fear and how to not allow the past to interfere with your future. And most important, what I try to uh, foster with my current interns, and that's why I started the internship program with the UN, was to, and actually I was saying that yesterday to one of the directors, that it is the youth that can make an important change in changing of our leaderships and that we should not allow leaders to use and abuse and enslave their people, whether through fear of Siberia or through uh, fear of not being able to get that home that they wanted or to fear that somebody is going to um, interfere with their progress. And uh, so I try to focus um, during my own life on 
enabling you to, to make the changes that this world will need in order to be able to survive and not destroy half of the fauna and flora and not destroy themselves. So uh, you certainly confirm a lot of what I try to live by. And it's uh, really a pleasant to have somebody that basically practices what they preach, because too often I fear, oh, I want to have this, this, this or that, that has nothing to do with the ability to be able to interact with other people and to help young people find out that they have a responsibility to make the world better. Amazing. Thank you, Dr. Durbach. Really, I think, you know, uh, you guys are doing amazing work and anything I can do, the Chopra Foundation can do to support, uh, amplify, help, you know, here to be of service. So I once again, I recommend thankful. everybody to go to, go to the website, cfi.chopraFoundation.org. Go take it. Any questions, I'm here to answer. Thank you very, very much. We very, very much appreciate your presentation. Susie, thank you very much for moderating. And I wish you a wonderful future and a wonderful week. Goodbye.